Hi again. Okay, this is the second video on the straws and paper. Um, I'm not actually bringing up the straws and paper because I am going to talk about um, one of Strawson's insights, advances, uh, something like that, um, that has lived beyond um, both Strawson's papers, Strawson's way of talking about it, um, and uh, the debate with Russell that Strawson's primarily concerned with here. The idea is the idea of presupposition. So we saw that word in the Frege sense and reference paper. Um, I'm also not going to explicitly talk about that all that much here, but okay. This is um, an idea that's become mainstream in linguistics. Um, it's uh, uh, widely acknowledged to be a thing, so to speak. Um, exactly how it works is uh, controversial and complicated, um, but the fact that there is such a thing is uh, commonplace. Now, how does the idea of presupposition figure in the debate with Russell? Well, put it this way, Russell thinks that, uh, so Russell and Strassen both agree that the sentence the present king of France is bald, entails that there is a king of France. But Strawson thinks that the kind of entailment is a presupposition. Russell thinks it isn't. What does that mean? Well, first of all, let me just be clear about what entailment means. So when a sentence P entails another sentence Q, that means if P is true, then Q must be true. That is, it's impossible for P to be true while Q is false. So in our case, if P is the current king of France is bald, and Q is France has a king, it's impossible to have this true while this is false. Okay, that's what it means for P here to entail Q. If this is true, then this has to be true. It's impossible for it to be false while that's true. Okay, Strassen and Russell agree, as long as this is true, this must, be, uh, this must also be true. The difference, though, is what happens if this thing down here is false, after all. What happens to this? Russell thinks if France has no king, so if Q here is false, then P here is also going to be false. Strassen thinks it's going to be neither true nor false. Okay. And a way of capturing that is so by saying both of them say there's an entailment Strassen thinks the kind of entailment is presupposition, Russell thinks it is not. What I'm going to talk about here is the general idea of presupposition, how you test, uh, one standard way of testing whether a given entailment is a presupposition. Okay. Now, okay, the examples that I've uh, put on the side here, these come from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on presupposition. I'll put a link to that both in the YouTube description here and uh, on the page on Canvas. Um, let me just show you the start of that uh, article. So here's your table of contents. You'll see there's quite a bit here, right? There's um, sections on an introduction, something called projection, something called cancelability, then a whole bunch of stuff on theories of presupposition and current issues in presupposition theory. I'm going to say for this class, don't worry about any of that stuff. We are going to focus on the general idea and some stuff about what's called projection. We may talk about cancelability. Um, cancelability, by the way, you may recognize that word from Grice, the uh, very first reading you had for this module that I made um, optional once we uh, once we had the strike on um, Grice talks about conversational implicature and one of the marks of implicature is cancelability. Just stick that um, in your back pocket. Don't worry about it for right now. Okay, 
So let's start here. Here are some stock examples of um, wide, what are widely agreed to be presupposition triggers, that is, um, types of words or phrases or expressions that um, tend to make the sentences containing them have a presupposition of some kind. Okay, one of the ones you'll notice on the list here, definite descriptions. So I said Strawson thinks definite descriptions like the King of France, or here you go, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Strawson thinks that those things trigger a presupposition. Russell denies this. Um, my impression is that um, today that is still controversial among philosophers. I think it's, I'm not a linguist, but I think it's less controversial among um, linguists that these kinds of expressions do indeed trigger presuppositions, as Strawson says. Um, the question about, well, let's leave it at that. Okay. Because, now, because those, uh, th that question is, um, whether it's controversial or not today, in 1950, it certainly was controversial. And as we're reading Russell and Strauss and debating this, um, I'm not going to just assume that definite descriptions trigger um, a presupposition. But let's look at some other examples. Um, so, factives, the factive verb in this case is knows. So, linguists think um, some verbs like this that take a sentence or a proposition as a complement a sentence like Berlusconi knows, blah, 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 that can only be true if blah, blah, blah is also true. You can't know things that are false. Linguists will also say, so philosophers will say that kind of thing too. You can only know true things, not false things. Linguists will say a sentence like this presupposes, it doesn't just entail, it presupposes that this thing is true. Um, here's an example that I'm going to work with you on, because I have found when I've lectured on this stuff, normally I would work through this stuff in in class, and I would ask you questions to see what you think is a presupposition. Um, this time I don't have that feedback. I was going to tell you, um, in the past, when I've lectured on this stuff to students at Queen's, people usually agree with me that um, this kind of expression does have a presupposition. I haven't told you how to tell whether you think this is a presupposition yet. Let me take this example, and we'll go from there. Okay, so let's take this as our example. I copied, didn't I? I can paste. No, I didn't copy. Copy. Paste. Okay, here's our example sentence. China has stopped stockpiling metals. That is alleged to presuppose that China used to stockpile metals. Okay, first of all, I want you to agree with me that this proposition that I'm calling P entails this proposition. So, if it's true that China has stopped stockpiling metals, it must also be true that China used to stockpile metals. I think that's right. Okay. Here's a test I'm going to give you for whether this entailment is a presupposition. So I need you to agree with me that if this is true, this must also be true. You can't have this true and this false. That's not allowed. The fact that you can't have this true while this is false, that tells you there's an entailment. Now I'm going to do something additional to test whether that entailment is a presupposition. So I'm going to take my original sentence that I'm calling P, and now I'm going to change it. I want to go from P to not P. So I'm going to say China has not stopped stockpiling metals. Now I'm going to check, I'm going to take exactly the same entailed sentence, and I'm going to ask, is it possible for this to be true while well, this is false? Let me give this thing a name. I'm going to call it, since I'm going to give it an example where we have no presupposition, I've already called that Q, let's call this R. So I have checked earlier, the first thing we did was I said, I, I uh, tried to bully you into agreeing, me with, agreeing with me that P entails R. Now I want to check, does not P entail R? That is, is it possible for this sentence to be true while this one is false? 
I don't think so. I think if we think China hasn't stopped, then it must be that they used to. Okay. So, look, if we're saying if P is true, R has to be true. But also if not P is true, then R still has to be true. Okay, this phenomenon is what linguistics call what linguists call projection. That is, they think that if P presupposes R, then not P also presupposes R. And the way they describe that is they say the pre the presupposition projects through negation. So putting a negation on here doesn't hide, it doesn't mask, it doesn't hem in the presupposition. The presu presupposition just sort of busts right through the negation and still um, is there. That second section of the SEP article, the Stanford Encyclo Encyclopedia article on projection, will go through lots of other kinds of constructions aside from negation to see what else um, presupposition projects true. Uh, the short answer is it's complicated, lots of things, but not others. Let me give you a contrast. Um, I'm going to make up a country. Here's my example sentence Q. Fredonia is a republic. Um, I think if that's true, then this has to also be true. That's what a republic is. Uh, part of what it is to be a republic is to not have a monarch. Okay, so I think if this is true, then this also has to be true. So let's call, so that's Q, let's call this S. Now I want to check, suppose not Q is true. So suppose instead of saying Fredonia is a republic, we say Fredonia is not a republic. And now I'm going to check, assuming that not Q is true, so assume this is true. Is this true? Well, it might be and it might not be. Um, it might be that Fredonia is not a republic. It's a monarchy. So in that case, not Q would be true. S would be false because Fredonia does have a monarch. On the other hand, it might not be a republic because it's some other kind of thing. Maybe it's a dictatorship. So it's not a republic. But it also doesn't have a monarch. It has like a generalissimo or something. So in that case, this would be true. So here's the relationship here. So up here, we said this sentence P about China stopping stockpiling metals. That entails the sentence R that China used to stockpile metals. Likewise, the sentence Q, Fredonia is a republic, entails that Fredonia has no monarch. In both cases, that means if the sentence is true, then the entailed sentence can't be false. It must be true. But the difference between P and Q is, so P entails R, but not P also entails R. Not P, if that's true, then R still has to be true. But not Q, does not entail S. Q entails S, not Q doesn't entail S. That means this is an entailment, but not a presupposition. P entails R, not P also entails R. That means this is an entailment and a presupposition. Okay, so think back to those sentences with definite descriptions that Russell and Strassen are talking about. So if let's call what letters are we down to? Let's call this well, let's call this A and let's call this B. So Russell and Strawson agree that sentence A entails sentence B. That is, if this is true, then this has to be true. But they disagree about what happens if this is false. Put it another way. They disagree about what happens with the negation of this thing and 
coming back to Russell, we know that we can't negate this just by saying the King of France is not bald. We need to say something because we have to worry about primary and secondary occurrences or scope ambiguity. We have to say something like, it's not true that this, or something like that. Um, something like this. Um, Strassen, it seems, is going to want to say that a sentence like this still requires that this is true. Russell denies it, at least the way I'm descri describing presupposition view. Okay. Now, if we're saying that the truth of a sentence like this, China has not stopped stockpiling metals, and the truth of a sentence like this, China has stopped stockpiling metals, both of those require that China used to stock, stock used to stockpile metals. Then we can ask what happens if that presupposed sentence is false? Well, you might naturally think, so so look, that means neither of these two sentences can be true. And we might think, well, if not P is true, that would mean P is false. So if we, if we assume that R is false, that means this is not true, and this is not true. Well, if not P isn't true, that's the same as saying P isn't false. Make sure I haven't covered this up. I have covered it up. There we go. Okay. So, not P can't be true. That means P isn't false. P can't be true. So, it looks like then we have to say P is not true, not false. So, it's neither true nor false. And that's what Strawson says about um, a sentence like, the present king of France is bald. Okay. Summing up, what I want you to be able to discuss on the exam is what the difference is between a presupposition and other kinds of entailment. I won't be too mad if you say, if you describe this as the difference between presupposition and entailment, but I prefer to describe presupposition as a kind of entailment. So I want you to be able to say what the difference is, and I want you to be able to describe this negation test. So this pattern that I've given you here is a test for whether a given entailment is a presupposition. Okay. You might remember when we read Frege on sense and reference and when he talked about the example sentence, um, Kepler died in misery he talks about something like a negation test. He says, look, we shouldn't say that the sentence Kepler died in misery asserts that there was such a person as Kepler. Um, or, sorry, I think he uses a definite description. The discoverer of the elliptical motion of the planets died in misery. That's Kepler, by the way. Um, he says, the reason we shouldn't take that to assert that Kepler ex existed, that there was such a person, is from what we see by looking at the negation. So he thinks, so start with a sentence like, call this sentence C, uh, Kepler died in misery. Frege says the negation of this is, Kepler didn't die in misery. But if the original sentence really meant there was such a person as Kepler, and he died in misery, then its negation should look like this. Either Kepler didn't die in misery, or the name Kepler is, your translation leaves this untranslated, is bedeutungslos, that is, is without reference. 
Okay, so Frege thinks if this thing says Kepler died in misery, so if this thing asserts that the name Kepler does refer to something and that um, uh, that person died in misery, then its negation should look like this. If I try to deny that C is true, it should sound like this. But in fact, it sounds like this. That tells you, Frege thinks, that this sentence presupposes that there is such a person as Kepler. Um, doesn't assert it. The way Russell writes a sentence like, the current king of France is bald, it seems to assert that there is exactly one um, current king of France. I'm going to stop there. Oh, geez, I hope this has cleared things up and not made them more obscure. Tell me if you have questions. Bye-bye.